Gray syndrome is when you give aspirin to a child that has some sort of predisposition that we can't give it, and it be, can be very dangerous. The only time we do give aspirin to a child is Kawasaki disease, right? Kawasaki thins the blood, prevents clots. But Ray syndrome is because they've taken aspirin when they didn't need it, and it could be um, a metabolic, but it's due to aspirin ingestion. So we routinely do not give aspirin to children. Febrile seizures usually occur in what? My firstborn grandson at 18 months old had his first febrile seizure and only febrile seizure. And it was very scary. These parents become maniacs about taking temperatures on their children. Now, let me tell you what a febrile seizure is. A febrile seizure is when you have no fever and within 20, 30 minutes, you have 102. So the rate of rise is quick. And the brain says, chick, 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 I don't understand. The temperature's going up too quick. And it sparks and creates a seizure. So how do we prevent febrile seizures? Well, we tried to get a fever medicated before it gets too high too quick. So you can imagine my daughter-in-law <laughs> took temperatures every hour on her both of her kids. And I understand it. She became a fanatic. The kid never had another one. Childhood hypopituitarism results in which condition? Now, when you don't get enough pituitary um, in your system, these children are these small children, like a pituitary dwarfism. Hyper is gigantism, which means they're going to be seven, eight foot tall. That's usually due to a pituitary tumor that has to be removed. But a childhood hypopituitarism, they're going to be small. There's nothing we can do about that. Um, we can prevent the hyper from getting too big by finding out why it's secreting too much. And as I said, it's usually a tumor requiring surgery. How would you describe precocious puberty. Now, puberty is usually at, according to the book, 12 years and four months for a girl. That's usually onset of menses in a girl. Precocious puberty is when it's too early. They say um, Caucasians, uh, girls age seven, African-Americans age six. Now, it can be also boys, okay? Boys can have beards at a young age, so we need to prevent that. And there's medicines we give, it's called Lupron actually, and we can stop it. Uh, girls, can you imagine being six, seven years old with breasts? They can be really teased and they don't understand what menses is. They think they're bleeding and they're going to die because that's what young kids think of, right? So we can suppress it onto the point where they should be going through puberty. So precocious is just early puberty. A multi-select. What lab values are important to monitor with a child with congenital hypothyroidism? Well, what are the hormones of the thyroid? So it's the T4 TSH. Growth has to do with the pituitary. Cortisol is the adrenal glands. T3, T4, TSH are your thyroids. If the TSH is high, the thyroxine is low. Thyroxine is high, the T TSH is low. They work like that, okay? One's high and one is lower. How can you monitor a child with hypo or hyperthyroidism?
too much, too little thyroid. Remember hypothyroidism, we worry about growth, right? So one of the reasons why we measure height and weight every visit, it's not only to measure nutrition, it's also to measure things like hypo hyperthyroidism, because maybe it's just not nutrition that's causing a problem. Maybe there's a problem somewhere else and it could be the thyroid gland. And sometimes that makes the physician look for it. What acid base alteration would you see in a diabetic child with Kuzmol's respirations? Well, Kuzmol is in diabetic ketoacidosis. It's metabolic acidosis. The body's trying to compensate. They start breathing differently, right? These Kuzmol's deep breaths, which becomes respiratory alkalosis, trying to compensate for the metabolic acidosis with diabetic ketoacidosis. So when you see these things that these children do, like, why are they doing it? Well, they're trying to compensate, um, trying to protect their body. The body always tries to protect itself. So that's how we do it with DKA. It's one of the ways. A multi-select. What would a child with Cushing syndrome look like? Cushing syndrome is an adrenal problem. Many times it's due to too many steroids. You know, I have rheumatoid arthritis and they gave me too much prednisone for too long. I gained 50 pounds and I was blown up like a Cushing baby until they realized, oh, you're on too much steroids. I'm like, I keep telling you, you need to listen. You're gonna have these thin extremities, you do which is weird, but then you're gonna hair on your chinny chin chin, these red cheeks, and you're gonna gain weight. You're not gonna lose weight. And these children, you know, look like the Pillsbury Doughboy. That's what I felt I look like. And you are, you're puffy. That's why if we need to be on steroids, let's put them in clothing. That's not gonna make them feel conscious about themselves. You know, put a size up, who cares? Make it loose, get them comfortable. I'm multi-select. You walk into a child, a room with a fever of 104.6, you're having a seizure. What can you do? What do you do? Fever of 104.6. Now, when we're talking about seizures with a fever, Unless it's hyperthermia because you sat in a car and that got them hot, you do never submerge them in water, okay? That's what we don't do. But if they got a fever, it's probably a febrile seizure. So check the bed, put the bed down flat, take them, turn them on their side, you know, protect those rails because they're going to be banging into them. And that's all we can do, protect them from injury. Good job. Autoimmune disease of the thyroid gland. And this is my daughter in law, my son's wife. And because of her, I really had to look it up because she had too many questions. You know, when you were a nurse, you know everything about everything, right? And everybody's going to ask you about everything. And you're a nursing student, so you know too, right? I still remember. What about this? And I'm like, I'm just in school. Give me a break. It is called Hashimoto's, and it's many different of the hormones are weird. They need to be really regulated closely. They really have these mood swings, but you cannot touch that thyroid gland. You cannot do surgery. It has to stay there. You have to regulate the hormones. So frequent, frequent visits, frequent levels to see where's T3, where's T4, where's TSH. We need to do those things, the anti-thyroid hormones, et cetera. Addison's disease. Well, that's the opposite of Cushing's.
So the adrenal gland is really good. It produces cortisone and aldosterone. And many times, you know, some children don't get it. So we have to give, you know, them the cortisol, um, aldosterone when, you know, because their body's not doing it. Remember with Addison's disease, we need to be aware that stress um, can cause those needs of the body to be more. So at those levels, those patients and families need to be, they're under a lot of stress, this is going on, make sure they're checking levels, giving them extra doses, you know, to keep them on a level plane because you do need your cortisol and your aldosterone. A multi-select, a ventricular peritoneal shunt, ventricle in the brain, the fourth ventricle. There's a tube that goes around the back of the ear, either side, goes up the front of the body and the tube drains into that peritoneum. And we use this in those children that can't deal with the own fluid bounce in their spinal column and in their brain. So what we do is they'll put this ventricular peritoneal shunt in. What is our job as a nurse with it? Well, there is a little pump behind the ear. Don't you ever touch it, okay? Only the neurosurgeon can touch it. What we can do is measure head circumference. If we see it getting bigger, we need to let the physician know. We can't. You know, positioning on it doesn't matter. And the other thing we're going to teach these family, if these children who have a ventricular peritoneal shunt become with headaches and vomiting, it's probably disconnected, probably needs a bigger shunt, they need to get help quick. They usually tell them to go right to a pediatric ER. They're going to do a CAT scan, probably go to surgery and fix it because it is pressures building in the brain. So what it does, it relieves that pressure. A common sign of Graves' disease includes blank or protrusion of the eyes. Hyperthyroidism. It is called exophthalmus, it's protrusion of the eyes. And it's one of the things, again, that could alert you to, you have a problem with the thyroid. A multi-select. Hypoparathyroidism has the symptoms of tetanic muscle contraction and what? Now, thyroid gland and the parathyroid are two different animals. The thyroid hormone has a T3, T4, TSH, those hormones for the body. The parathyroid works with calcium. Whenever you see questions about calcium, magnesium, always think of muscle, muscle contractions and spasms, okay? Absolutely think of that. And how are you gonna answer that question? Calcium, magnesium. So when you don't have enough calcium, your muscles are weak because you don't have the calciums for contraction. You're going to have them just go into technic. And then, of course, your calcium levels are low. It's all part of it, okay? A multi-select. What are signs of hyperparathyroidism? Now, this is too much calcium. So part of it is the nausea, the vomiting. It's also, you know, neuro with that confusion. But with the muscles, there's this numbness in your hands, feet, um, legs. Um, it's all part of too much calcium in the body. What does the parathyroid hormone do?
I think if I gave you any question about a parathyroid right now, you would be able to answer it because you know what it does and you know the signs of it. So we are, know that the parathyroid is all about calcium regulation. Which of the following might be a cause of an adrenal crisis? It's also called Addisonian crisis. Well, what does the adrenal gland regulate? What are some things that work like the adrenal gland? So if we go and have steroids and we're on a dose for six months and we just stop, we're going to go into an adrenal crisis. That's why we get that medrol dose pack starts with seven and it goes down to one pill because you get the big dose and then you taper off very, very slowly over a week. So that's why we never, ever just stop steroids. They must be tapered. A multi-select. Cardinal signs of diabetes insipidus. I asked you earlier, let's ask you again. Remember, diabetes insipidus has to do with pituitary gland, and the opposite is the SIADH, syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. So diabetes insipidus, nothing to do with hunger, no polyphagia. It's all about fluid, polyuria, polydipsia. Thirsty, 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 urinate, urinate, urinate. And no matter what you do, thirsty, 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 and you're going to urinate. How do we treat it? It's steroids. Multi-select. Congenital hypoplasia parent teaching should include. You know, the adrenals uh, tend to secrete hormones. And when we don't get enough hormones, and when mommy's pregnant, a baby can be born, and we don't know if they're a boy or a girl, okay? And not known if they're a boy or girl, and you're saying, well, why? Well, you could have a penis and a vagina. You could have a um, testicles and no penis just a clitoris. There is mixed match. We don't know. What they, I've seen only one in my career and it was testicles and it had um, just a clitoris and, we're, and there was no vagina. And it was like, all right, where are we going to urinate? There was a little meatus for that. So how did we assign? Did I have a boy or a girl? Can you imagine this parent? So what they did is they did ultrasounds and they did hormone testing. They found out what was more in this child. And then they go through plastic surgeries to make the child into that, whether um, the boy or the girl, they will never have children. They don't have all the body parts, okay? And this is the child that needs cortisol and aldosterone replacement, all due to that. I've only seen one. What causes type 1 diabetes? I like this math test. Bob has 36 candy bars, he eats 29. And what does he have now? Diabetes. <laughs> I had to put that one there. It was just too funny not to. You know, type 1 diabetes is when your pancreas is being attacked by your body. And your pancreas does not secrete insulin. And when you don't have insulin, all that carbohydrate you can't use. So what happens to your body? Blood glucose levels go really high because you can't use it. There's nothing. There's no insulin to digest it to make it workable. So then what does the body do? It says, you know, I'm hungry, but I can't eat sugar. But OK, I can eat proteins. So it starts eating other things um, for energy. So it starts eating protein, could, which could be, you know, muscles and joints and, you know, anything with protein in it. But the digestion from protein is ketones. That's why you get ketones in your body. 
So you have high, this is DKA, and you get high blood sugars because the pancreas can't use it. And then it's eating the protein because it's hungry and it's producing ketones. So that's how you get diabetic ketoacidosis, very simply. What statement about a pheochromocytoma is correct? This is a tumor that lives in the kidney adrenal area. Pheochromocytoma. But it's different type of tumor. This tumor is, even when you like touch it, um, it can cause some break off of this tumor and it's a catecholamine. What's a catecholamine? Well, this will see a, a child or even an adult, you can find them. All of a sudden the heart rate goes up, blood pressure goes up because all of a sudden maybe you touch the area, it released some of this catecholamines and everything goes up, 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 up. And usually these things are very difficult to diagnose. They look at the heart first. They look at seeing if there's some other place in the heart that's creating a elevated heart rate, 24 hour monitoring and CAT scans and cardiac, this and that. And finally they determine it's this tumor which they can remove. Nursing, we need to be watching vital signs on these patients. So I'll multi-select. What action should the nurse implement in the care of a patient with a pheochromocytoma? So the kid's coming in preoperatively, he's gonna to go to surgery. We're gonna be removing this tumor. Remember, it's a tumor that does what? Everything goes up, right? So you're gonna watch the heart rate and you're gonna watch the blood pressure. Has nothing to do with weight gain at all. Has nothing to do with sugar. It's all about catecholamines. You know, fight or flight, sympathetic, right? Up, up, that's what it feels like. It's like a release of epinephrine. I'll multi-select. Nursing care the unconscious child include. You know, you think about nursing care of a child, unconscious, adult, unchild. You're going to do the same things. You know, I've worked both ICUs. Adults, I've worked in pediatric ICUs with these patients unconscious. We're going to, of course, unconscious, we want to check their brains. Are their pupils working or not? That's going to tell us outcomes. Pain control, not as much. We're more looking for... Um, the vital signs, um, temperature, seeing anything that's going to make the brain hurt more. And we know that too much fluid going to the brain can cause swelling more and could cause more problems, of course, with the neuro checks. Symptoms of DKA are. And the one thing about DKA, they're brought in and they tell you you have diabetes and these kids are pale. They're pretty lethargic. Um, they're usually wheeled in in a wheelchair. They feel horrible. And you put them in a room, close the door. The nurse walks in after, opens the door and this fruity smell hits you in the face. It smells like rotten peaches. That type of fruity smell. Of course, we're going to have Increased blood sugars, hyperglycemia, and of course the body's hungry, it's eating proteins because it's not getting its sugar, so it's going to be ketone area. I'll multi-select. An adolescent with a BMI above 95% has been urinating a lot. What test can you anticipate? What do you think is going on here? Urinating a lot, what do you know? Symptoms, urinating a lot. BMI, 95, they're heavy. What's going on? So we know we wanna do a urinalysis to rule that out for sure, but then we're gonna do a hemoglobin A1C. 
Yes, we're going to do electrolytes too. I didn't click that one there. Pregnancy, I don't think it has anything to do with this. We're going to rule out diabetes here, right? It's all about diabetes. Diabetic ketoacidosis is caused by what? What does the body do? So we can have, you know, hyperglycemia, but then we can have diabetic ketoacidosis. Where do the ketones come from? You don't have insulin, so the body said, I'm hungry, I'm starting eating proteins. Byproduct is gonna be ketones. So it uses other things, other fuels for energy, which first of all will be your protein. A multi-select. A child's minute with blood sugar greater than 600, large ketones in the urine. What is your priority intervention? What do you do first? We we're talking about sickle cell last week. Priority interventions in IV fluid, right? What's our priority here? We want an IV fluid now and connected to that is a slow, regular insulin drip, which we will titrate according to their blood sugars. We're gonna give nothing sub-Q. We want immediate treatment. I have seen blood sugars 1,100. I've seen pH is 6.8, and these kids come back from it. So get that fluid in there, bolus them, then get them their regular insulin, and then you're gonna start looking at their electrolytes because we know potassium is going to be lost. We're not going to give anything sub-Q. A diabetic child complains of feeling jittery. Blood sugar is 45. What's the best treatment for this child? Now, this question mm -hmm. says the child's complaining of being jittery. That will tell you what you can do. You know, patient condition, they're awake and they're alert. A cup of orange juice is fine. Absolutely. They even say a cup of milk, something. Give them something with a little sugar in it. Your patient's experienced a head injury. What would most concern you? Swelling in the brain. Where, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in that brain. So which one of these is the most concerning? And it's that urinary output. There's swelling going on there. It's affecting the brain and it's going to cause more swelling in the head. So that decreased urinary output is your number one priority to take care of. I'll multi-select. How do you detect ketoacidosis? So we know ketoacidosis means your body hasn't used sugar. So yeah, you're going to have elevated blood sugars. Also, we know that we look for those ketones in the urine. And of course, you're going to have that four plus glucose too, because your sugar's everywhere. A multi-select. What would alert you that a child's head injury is deteriorating? They're getting confused now. They are restless. Um, not becoming confused becomes more confused, actually it comes to be, but becoming restless, difficult to arouse. And they've had a headache, the headache's getting worse, okay? Mm -hmm. That would be the difference in words there. A child's been diagnosed with bacterial meningitis. What is the nursing priority of care? 
What are they going to do? I mean, they've got bacterial meningitis. We have viral and bacterial. When you have viral meningitis, it's a virus. How do we treat it? Tylenol, Motrin, you know, and drink fluids. Keep that fever down. Keep them quiet. Bacterial needs antibiotics. And nothing else is going to cure it. So antibiotics are your priority of care. Number one, maybe keeping the head up too, but antibiotics. What's the primary cause of injury associated with submersion? I live in South Florida. We get children who drown. They're on the bottom of the pool. Sometimes by the time rescue gets there, somebody's pulled them up, did a little CPR, they cough, spit out water, and now they're running around. Remember, injury can happen up to 72 hours later. These children will be admitted to be watched. But the injury is hypoxia, hypoxemia, because water went to the lungs, they're not breathing. That's the injury. Last question, multi-select. Which CSF lab value correlates with bacterial meningitis diagnosis? I mean, I think as nurses, you know, working in the ER a lot, we're gonna do, you know, the spinal taps. And when we see a clear one, we're happy because we know probably no white cells, not bacterial. We're gonna see that grossly cloudy looking, milky looking thing. We know elevated white counts. We're gonna look at those levels when they come back. Bacteria loves sugar, so it eats it up. So it's low glucose. And we're gonna have elevated protein. Um, and it's gonna be increased white blood cells. We should not have any red blood cells in a really good performed tap. You'll have a couple, cause you still do get it, but you shouldn't. M&M, which color candy today? Kelly, good job, Kelly, good job. Number one, KB. Number four, Ashley and Eden. Good job, guys. What I want you to do is sign your attendance attestations, get them done. As I told you, I will be posting things. It's not going to be till Saturday. I've had some messages here. I will try to be answering them shortly. So, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, or one of these things, okay? This means mm, not quite. But remember, the lowest grade I got. 72 and the highest was 100. So it could be anywhere in between. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good class as always. Thank you. Thank My you. pleasure. Thank you.